welcome to the D3D4 Football Podcast with me, your host, James Richards. Hello everyone, welcome to a uh, rather ad hoc D3D4 Football Podcast. Obviously, you'll all be aware of the news yesterday that Berry lost their place in the EFL um, after being unable to get the sale of the club through and without being able to for the EFL to see proof of funds that they could meet their commitments this season. And I never thought it would come to this, personally. I thought there would be some sort of solution found. I know that perhaps um, that was being naive or maybe just hopeful, but un- unfortunately the worst-case scenario has happened and, and Barry have lost their place. Rightly or wrongly, uh, rightly or wrongly um, the EFL made that decision late last night and... We are here to discuss sort of the ramifications of it, what we think needs to change in football. You know, the fact that there are four of us sitting here, and I'll introduce the other three shortly, but I don't think in our lifetimes that we can properly remember. I mean, I know Maidstone in 92 went, but I can't remember uh, anything like this in football. Uh, but to say it hasn't been coming would be kidding ourselves, I think. Um, I am joined by Gabriel Sutton of the Football Lab. Gabe, welcome to the show. Thank you. Um, I'm pleased to be here, but I'm, I'm sad that it's um, it's in these circumstances, really, because yeah, uh, I'm you know, deeply upset by yet the news regarding Berwick Football Club. I'm also joined by Chris Stringer, uh, the podcast co-host. How are you doing, Chris? Yeah, it's just really sad. I was at the club on Saturday and I talked to so many fans and they were so hopeful for the future when the news of that takeover came in. And it's heartbreaking, the news that's come through, really. And we're joined by one man who I can only sympathise hugely with. It's Peter Taylor, uh, better known as Bury Me in Exile on Twitter. Peter, um, how are you feeling right now? Because I can imagine it, it's it's been it's been pretty tough for you over the last few months. Yeah, uh, thanks for having me on again, James. Um, it was pretty difficult to sleep last night. I I, would, I knew I wouldn't be able to sleep without um, seeing the news and the AFL have been putting out statements. Pretty lately, as of late, um, about Barry and Bolton. Uh, but at once I saw the news, I, I kind of knew it was coming, obviously, but it probably took me a good two to three hours afterwards to um, settle down into any kind of sleep for the night. And I'm sure that was repeated in thousands of poems across Barry and elsewhere, to be honest. Yeah, I can imagine. And, you know, I'm not a Barry fan, but... I think there's so many football fans out there who sort of not just sympathise, but they can relate to this. I mean, there's so many clubs in my lifetime. Oxford United nearly went out of business um, sort of late 1990s, early 2000s. I mean, the whole of the 90s was spelt, uh, spent on a shoestring budget. Oldham have had their, their problems. Gabe, you'll be aware of Birmingham having financial difficulties in their time. Portsmouth fans will have, of course, uh, listening to this, know only too well what it's, what it's like going through that as a club. And, you know... Frankly, it's it's a huge letdown that in an age of absolute wealth in football that we see a football club go to the wall because of financial problems. Now, we're going to get into the debate at some point in this podcast, I'm sure, about what needs to change and talk about the Premier League clubs having all this wealth. And I mean, there's no getting away, Peter, I suppose, from the fact that the demise of Berry comes from the way it was run by the previous owner, largely. Yeah, absolutely. There's no um, finger pointing that can be done at the EFL or particularly Premier League clubs or any outside body over and above um, the, the running the club, as you say, by Stuart Daly, Stuart Day, sorry, and um, latterly Steve Dale. You know, without going too much against them in particular, just it's it's obvious to what from what for all to see what's been in the media recently and all the. Interviews that Steve Dale did and the way he comes across and any cursory look at the accounts from previous seasons because again, the last one from 2017, 2018 is still yet to be published because the um, auditors have never been paid. So that's why it's never been published and who knows, maybe, maybe it will never see the live day after um, obviously the news last night. Yeah, really, really disappointing. Um, I mean, do we? I mean, do we think? I've seen, and we've all seen these tweets by um, 
very North MP, I think it is, James Frith. I mean, is yeah. there any hope, do you think, for the club? Because there were reports that a, a big multinational company had got proof of funds and were wanting to buy Berry. I mean, the big problem was that the CNN deal collapsed with only an hour of the, the sort of the, the cut-off point left, and it left literally no no time for anything to be sorted. But potentially there was a, a big company that did want to try and rescue Berry. Yeah, possibly, but again, it's hard to prove sort of after the fact the veracity of it. This, I mean, I've obviously seen where it says, oh, they've got proof of funds of seven million pounds, et cetera, et cetera, but none of us sitting here actually know that for, you know, for a fact one way or another. Um, obviously there's the usual questions that arise or oh, why, you know, and why is it happened so late if it is true and all this sort of thing. I mean, I know last week there was talk of, um, for, interested parties but I think when you when it comes down to it really that the sort of the catalyst for this is Steve Dale's reluctance and it is it is in the public domain his reluctance to even speak to other parties let alone accept an offer and that's why only last Friday um, CNN's offer was accepted and the extension that the EFL allowed um was only covering what, effectively 24 hours of nine business hours after Bank Holiday Monday anyway, so it's not wasn't really a much of an extension for those talks to continue. And the, obviously, CNN didn't like what they found in the latter points of due diligence, and it's no surprise to me or many other fans or uh, onlookers whatsoever. Do you think though that Steve Dale? was rejecting offers because he wanted more out of it for himself. And then when that CNN deal collapsed, he suddenly, it appeared anyway, that he suddenly was realised that he was going to lose the EFL status of the club, which then obviously devalues the club that he owns. And then he started accepting offers pretty much left, right and centre, if, if what I've read is correct. I can, I can only postulate, of course. Um, originally, what he put out there was he wanted for himself a million pounds and I think the CNN one was um, 200,000 so perhaps the brinkmanship on his part didn't work in his favour and like you say just started accepting offers willy nilly because the golden share that is um, Barry's membership the EFL was about to be removed so obviously that would have devalued the club not that it holds much um, positive value anyway in financial terms, but would have devalued them overnight. So, yeah, perhaps it's just, he might, perhaps he just realised too late in the day that it just wasn't, it wasn't worth him personally holding on for so long because he wasn't going to get what he wanted out of it. And, and even if he did, his reputation, such as it was, is, you know, has been held up to so much scrutiny in the media and obviously most of it very negative scrutiny. It'd just be hard for anybody to take, really. Yeah, I can imagine, though I will not sympathise with him, to be quite honest. Cause <laughs> no, but Why not, I mean, James? Yeah, well, yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, anyone who comes across in the media and is quite happy to state that he doesn't even know the town where he's bought the club has that a football club. Staggering. That was a staggering interview where he just... He, he, he sits there almost... Proud of the fact that it's easy for him to walk away from Barry, like he's not ruining the lives of thousands of people with every action that he takes. Yeah. It, Again, you know, though, like this, this all comes down in the end to who do we let run our football clubs, and how do we go forward to make sure something like this doesn't happen again? Because I'm not at all convinced that we won't be sitting in this situation. Maybe next week. Maybe not that soon. Maybe next month. In a couple of seasons. It's. There needs to be a fundamental change in the way that football is governed and the way that financial uh, or, or income from from solidarity payments is, is dist- distributed. Um, I think if if we don't, this, this is a, this is a turning point one way or another. One way or another, I think if we do see change, brilliant, great stuff. If we don't see change, I think. Over the next 12, 24, 36 months, we'll see a tumbling of lower league football clubs, particularly from the northwest, with, with the likes of 
all right, Bolton have just been rescued, but there's no saying that couldn't couldn't start again if, if future problems arise. You've got Macclesfield, you've got Markham, you've got Oldham, um, Rochdale, exactly. yeah, uh, and you've got Rochdale that appear to be okay, but I mean they're they're in the same boat as other cl- clubs that they've got low gates. I, I something has to change or we're going to lose the very foundation of our our football. Just yeah, don't watch Dale a second. I mean, the the loss of Berry from that league is going to cost them a hundred thousand pounds. Yeah, just per year. <laughs> those two fixtures. Yeah, which is just such a, a one. It highlights how important football is in a regional sense, you know. And two, it highlights just how precarious the financial situation for clubs are. That if you rely on a particular fixture, and this won't be an alien concept to a number of clubs, you know especially at a lower level, um, that you can lose massive amounts of money. I mean, I find it really sad that we've got this, this to this state in a in a game of, of, you know, such national importance. And I mean, Gabe, you may want to chip in here because I know you're deeply upset by this and you, like all of us here, will not have seen something like this before. Um, but perhaps you won't... <coughs> like the rest of us here, won't be surprised by it because we've, we've known about these issues and problems. In fact, I think I've probably harked on about it to the point where I've irritated people um, <laughs> regarding it. But I think it it's coming to the fore now of just how important change and financial security is going to have to be for clubs going forward. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I, I must admit, um, I think you've hit on something really important there, James, because I remember talking to you about this issue a couple of years ago and to be honest there's there's a kind of a football pundit at that point and I don't necessarily like saying this but um I didn't particularly enjoy sort of um worrying about the sort of the financial issues within football and the the sort of unjust side of it just because I you know I enjoy thinking about the tactical side of the game and the rest of it but I think what we've seen uh, certainly over the last 12 months um is that we can't ignore the financial issues within English football. We have to uh, really address it because if we turn a blind eye to it, more clubs uh, like Perry are going to find themselves in the same situation. Um, so I, I'd like to kind of um, put forward a couple of changes that I feel the EFL have to make um, to the, or, or for English football generally have to make in terms of the way sort of we govern ourselves. Um, firstly, there's a sort of an, an owners and directors test, which you can find on the EFL website. It's essentially the, the fit and proper person test, which um, we all sort of refer to. Um, now, there's seven, essentially seven main, sort of, no, eight, sorry, main categories that are essentially disqualifying conditions that stop somebody... Um, <clears throat> getting on board with a club in a, uh, an ownership or administrative uh, capacity. Uh, and the main one I would like to sort of refer to is, is unspent convictions. Um, now, to me, uh, I'm not 100% sure about this because I'm not a legal expert, um, but if unspent conviction is um, the thing that is a disqualifying condition. Does that suggest that if a potential buyer either wasn't convicted for an illegal act or they've served their time, that they're qualified to, to run a football club in the eyes of, of the EFL? So I think that's a massive thing. Yeah, to, yeah I think that is in fact. Yeah, I think yeah. you're exa- yeah. exactly Ken, right on that. Ken Anderson had been, um, this, I, I, I'm not sure if this was a, uh, illegal activity, but he was, uh, banned from being a director of a company, any company, for eight years, which was the maximum uh, ban that could be given to him. Uh, just before he took on the very foot. But yeah, since he'd spent it, it was all in the files. Yeah, yeah, of course, great. Oh, just terrific, that isn't it? You know, you, you've you've been found guilty of being incompetent at running a business, or maybe even worse. And because the maximum sentence they can give you. For that is an eight-year ban. Well, seeing as you've served your eight-year ban, jolly on, mate. You can come and buy an <laughs> EFL club. And started paying himself five hundred and fifty thousand pounds a year for the privilege of only nothing to see policy. here. Nothing and to his, see here at all. And his son, one hundred and fifty thousand pounds oh, a year. Oh god, it gets better, doesn't but it? But there's it's... no issues in football. It's ridiculous. You know, and we and we sit here on a tragic. I mean, 
you know, just to put the mood in, I mean, I came back from watching Crawley make history. You know, uh, they just knocked Norwich City of the Premier League out of, out of the cup. And yet, as soon as I heard the news, I just, all that joy that I had experienced of watching a wonderful night of football was completely sucked away because... Yeah, sorry about fun- that. <laughs> yeah, cheers, Chris, for the call. Yeah. The <laughs> fundamental foundation of football, though, it relies on us having our local clubs in, you know, playing in, on our doorsteps in a sustainable way. And, you know, just to give you an example, Crawley, what a club that is. Like, I took my two children down there. Both of them are on the autistic spectrum. And we would have had to leave that game. But because they supply a area for kids to go and relax, they have Xboxes, they have giant Connect 4 football tables, and they even have dedicated staff um, who are there to sort of help entertain the kids... I was able to stay in and watch that game, which would have been impossible otherwise. And I have to say, Nathan Bates, if you're listening to this, what a bloke you are. Fantastic help that you gave. But, you know, this is this is just me as a, as a, a visitor. I mean, some people will probably rely on these services and the friendly nature of their football clubs. You, you've got that huge sense. And Crawley is, you know, one of the smaller clubs, I suppose you could say, in the, in the EFL right now. But how important they are to their community and how that comes across as just a neutral walking in there. Fantastic. So, you know, it's a fact that criminals, essentially, who have not been criminals for less than a decade, are able to buy a football club and then pay themselves huge sums of money as people on the board. I mean, you know, Gabe, you've hit a point right in the head there, not to digress too much. But yeah, carry on, Gabe, because, you know, I'm sure there's plenty of other things in that fit and proper person test and the way it is that... If they don't change, we're just going to be... I mean, I'm holding my head here. It's ridiculous. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, it's, it's quite sort of... Um, I almost find it quite sort of depressing, really, in terms of the way English football is structured. And uh, another thing, not to go on to uh, a sort of, you know, a gloom kind of podcast, but it kind of is that way, given what's happened to Barry. Um, I'd just like to look at this. The um, the latest Premier League TV deal um, was valued at approximately £4.5 billion. Um, then you're looking at £595 million for the EFL, of which um, 80%, so £476 million, went to the Championship. Um, £71 million, so 12% of the EFL fee. Uh, £71 million went to League One. Uh, and then 8%, so 46 po- 47.6 million to League Two. So if we're saying that the disparity in TV income is directly proportionate to the disparity in other sources of revenue, which I, I think is reasonable, then I'm concluding that the average League Two club receives approximately 0.1% of the wealth of the average Premier League club, um, and the average League One club 0.2%. So what we're seeing is a huge... Um, sort of what I'd call a heaven and hell divide, which means that extremely and and perhaps overly ambitious owners, um, like we've seen with Stuart Day at Berry, uh, they're desperate to avoid the the low income in League One and Two and gain the high income above, which is basically a kind of a a buy now, ask questions later uh, way of looking at things. Um, So I I think that the way to stabilise matters would be to reduce the imbalance um, and thus create a a more sustainable uh, economic climate. Absolutely, I completely agree with that. And the fact that you say there's all this money in the championship, I don't know if this is correct, guys, and Peter, you, you probably will know, but I'm sure no club in the championship posted any sort of profit in the last account. Yeah, not a single one, even though they got 80%, even though some of them would have received parachute payments on top of the solidarity payments, not a single one has made a profit. Well, they wasn't the championship, championship clubs an average... Um, spending 104% of their income. Just on wages, not not spending it full stop. That's just on player wages. Uh, there you go. <laughs> so. yeah. and, and, and we're surprised that we've got financial and, problems. And, 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 and of, of course, the one of the issues Barry was having was that it, as a system, it was trying to, it was sort of spending the same way of, of, a, of a bottom half championship club, wasn't it? Yeah, essentially. I mean, it, it was following on from Stuart Day, who was mainly the main party in this case. Stuart Day's five-year vision to get the club to the championship because that's where all the money is. But as we've just discussed, that it is where all the money is, but it's also where all the outgoings are as well. So there would have been a heck of a lot higher outgoings on wages and such anyway. So 
it's far from a, a promised land, even if Barry were were able to reach that on, in that time frame. It's ridiculous. I mean, what do we think, though, guys? And I'll, I'll start with you. This uh, you on this, Gabe? When we have a lot of fans saying it's to do only with how clubs are being run at a local level, rather than anything to do with the, the Premier League money that's coming in at the top. I mean, you know my position on this. I completely disagree with that statement, but I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on it. Um, I, I don't think the two uh, issues are mutually exclusive. I think on the one hand, uh, yes, clubs do need to uh, run themselves in a way that's sustainable um, and think about things in a, in a long term way and sort of look towards a kind of a, a plan rather than progression. Um, rather than sort of throwing money at things and saying um, if we succeed now then we'll get the championship revenue and everything will be fine no everything's not fine because in the championship as um, as you pointed out uh, clubs are making losses anyway so you've got to start now thinking about how can we make ourselves uh, sustainable with the revenue that's that's here and also account for the worst case scenario Um, on the flip side of that I think that um, the financial climate that the FA, the Premier League and the EFL, uh, all our governing bodies have created, uh, I think have maybe catalyzed the mentality that owners like Stuart Day um, have, have, have run the clubs with. Uh, and I think that needs addressing urgently. Yeah, absolutely agree with that 100%. I think if you create an environment where there is a promised land, even though we just discussed it really isn't, you are going to get so many owners sort of being reckless and chasing that that dream and it's it's caught a number of clubs out big time um you're filling me with joy here because that's what our owners um put down as one of his goals oh i remember it well (laughs) yeah league one within three years championship within five wasn't it league one within two actually uh, I think it was. I think what it was it with a five year. No, it was, plan it, was, anyway. it was three. It was three years to get back to League One, which I thought was, uh, and then yeah, and another two to get to the Championship after that. It's. I don't get this thing with a five year plan. Like every chairman that comes in always says, "I've got a five year plan." Well, if you gave a manager more than five months, that would be a good start to try and achieve your plans. I you mean, need head coach. Oh, head, yeah, head, <laughs> yeah, head coach these days, indeed. You know, and maybe letting you know manager sign some players that have actually played football at this level before. That might help as well. I mean, I don't know. I don't want to get off too too much of a tangent because I think you know fundamentally, Barry's demise has come in an environment that has created the potential for it to happen, and it's been there for a long, long time. I mean, Barry have the misfortune of being the club that it happens to, but it <laughs> the way that anyone can buy a football club, this has just been a it's just been a matter of time that they happened to a well-established football league club. Yeah, you look at Oldham. I walk around that ground with you. And essentially, owners have been allowed to go into Oldham and asset strip the club so they literally own nothing. Yeah. The club owns not even the ground around it. It doesn't own the stadium. It owns nothing. So how can a club that is a local asset community own none of the local asset communities in which it is housed? And all of that goes to rich businessmen who've come in and been opportunistic at best in removing those assets. I mean, Oxford are exactly the same. We don't own our stadium. Uh, we our, our previous stadium was sold for nearly 13 million, and we got not a penny of it. You know, and it's happening time and time again. I I would not be surprised. I mean, we all pray that Andy Holt kind of guys come in and run our clubs, but mm-hmm. you know, he the fact that he is such a maverick shows the state of ownership he's the sanest man of the football league <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, literally I, I mean i think andy holt's efforts are so valuable at this time because he's the uh, the you know pretty much probably the only chairman in the whole uh, efl who's sort of speaking out about these issues and we, we absolutely need the the effort that he puts into it yeah i just wish someone with some power to affect the game as a whole would support him and echo his ideas but you know cream off the top and all that no one's interested in in doing it which is really sad and Gabe carry on with your points because I'm sure um, as we try not to make this hugely long but they're very valid well uh, th- those were the two points um, in bullet um, in bulk um, yeah I, I just kind of 
um, I want that the I think what Chris said was was quite an important thing in terms of this being quite a pivotal moment in in English football in terms of um, I think if we learn from the situation with Barry um, and we think about how to redistribute the wealth and, and examine um, the um, the uh, owners and directors test, uh, then I think we can make some really worthwhile changes. Um, but if we let it happen then I think it's we're almost going to um, get into a cycle of more things happening like this. So for me, I think that this is a crucial moment for English football, and I just hope that the main governing bodies uh, do take notice of this. And why do I sit here feeling in my heart that I just can't have faith in them at this moment in time to, to do the right thing and to change it? I have the same feeling. Peter, your idea, I mean, you know, the EFL have essentially been shown to have literally no power to affect things. Uh, we were discussing that we think clubs should be put under a special status where, in fact, you know, they're like a community asset, essentially. They um, have different rules than businesses in the way that they're governed. And, you know, we need a body. It doesn't have to be the EFL, but it has to be something with powers that, if I mean, Andy Holt mentioned this, is if you don't run your club sustainably, you you lose your club, you know if you run it in a reckless way you don't get the right to keep it and actually the EFL or whoever the body may be should have the powers to remove you from ownership of that club yeah absolutely I've been an advocate for, well from reading his tweets for a long time now of um, independent regulation of football I don't assume for a single second that it's a silver bullet to every single problem within the English game but there's certain aspects where the, the lack of transparency at clubs from the Premier League to League to League Two and even further down than that is just ridiculous. When essentially the fans are the are the stakeholders, of, not that I particularly like that term, but are the stakeholders of the club, are the custodians, are the people who will be there, hopefully long after any owner or player or manager has come and gone, and they're often too often. Almost every single of those clubs kept in the dark, kept in the dark financially in the accounts that are allowed to be published with not even a profit and loss sheet, um, kept, kept in the dark about major decisions, not being, not usually on the board if the clubs aren't fan owned, like, um, Wickham are, but that might be about to change anyway. That aren't fan owned, they just have no representation whatsoever. So really they're at, they're at the whims of their owner and hoping that that their um you know that that their that their intentions are benevolent because if they're not any any club not just Barry but any club is one in the current structure one bad owner from uh, meeting the same fate, which is outrageous. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, because yeah. look how many. I mean, I can't. I find it hard to even put myself in the fans of. You know the Berry fan shoes right now because it just seems it's such a, such a big thing to try and understand that your football club is is basically gone and you know I, we we've seen it all the time where it's a lot of clubs are on the brink but we've they've always just about managed to survive but that's going to get less I mean like you say it's going to get less and less frequent if one dodgy owner and we like Gabe's touched on we haven't got a test to prevent dodgy owners coming in and taking over clubs. So this is going to be something that's going to happen more and more often. You know, we're going to see this happen on a regular basis, and it it simply should not be the case. I mean, your idea of independent regulation, what would that look like in your eyes? Essentially, a, a non-football-based governing body, because let's be honest, the governance of English football is a mess anyway. There's the FA, which mainly deal obviously with their their competitions, which are you know the FA Cup, the VAR, FA Vars, the Trophy, and all the um, competitions below national league north and south level and their um their local equivalent their local county equivalents for each of the leagues further down those competitions there's thousands of clubs there and hundreds of leagues and not just um senior men's football it can be women's it can be juniors for you know all, all sorts of categories so there's there's thousands of different clubs and individuals attached to that so that's quite a bloated organization as is there's the EFL, which are essentially at this moment in time an absolute thrall to the Premier League, um, mainly because they've been bullied over the last 
especially the last few years, just an example, E Triple P, the elite player performance plan where Premier League clubs can essentially take any cap two, which is like the not top level of um, youth academy, but and three and four, which are the ones below that, take any of their players for an absolute pittance, and then yeah, the, obviously the club don't don't really the club that they go from don't see much money of, of that. If you know, they might insert a, a, a deal where it's like twenty percent of profit in the next sale, but it's just yeah, not not often does it come to fruition. It's theft, um, essentially. Yeah, theft and um, really, the Premier League want a closed shop. They want the clubs that get relegated from it to come back in the next time. That's exactly what parachute payments are for, because it distorts the competition in the championship. You know, every every club that's just been relegated from the Premier League has a massive financial advantage to um, regain their status in the top Even flight. though Stoke are doing their best to try and hide that fact right now. Well, well, yeah, they didn't have, <laughs> didn't have a good Stoke first though. season. Obviously, uh, I think they're bottom in the very early runnings of the championship right now. Uh, but yeah, essentially, they have a massive inherent advantage. There's a whole timeline of two sort of timelines in my mind where this has led up to the events of Barry. It's not... There's the, there's the timeline within the club itself, obviously, where going back six years when Stuart Day bought it and all the events since then which have been excellently illustrated particularly by David Conn in The Guardian all the financial um, dodgy dealings and all that sort of thing are, are in the public domain now but there's also the timeline where and I'm not really against player power or anything like that in a broad sense but we go back even 50 years there's the so the maximum salary cap was removed by a certain Jimmy Hill. And then obviously the, the formation of the Premier League was essentially to break away so that the top teams got a, a more, a greater distribution of the money. And then the whole thing about gate receipts being shared between the home team and the away team was done away with. The Bosman ruling, TV money, Inexorably, until very recently, going up and up and up, and, and now it's propped up by um, the international market because it's actually still out, slightly gone down for the domestic market. So that's something to keep an eye on. Yeah. So there's lots of these things that that don't look like necessarily like they intersect, but when you, as I've said earlier in this podcast, when you see how much player salaries are in the championship and how much they account for of a club spend, then you kind of think. That's the ma- that's usually the main expenditure for all these clubs. So it's kind of got to start there, essentially. If there's independent regulation, where they a proper cap, not I don't mean like oh they can only spend five thousand pounds a week. I mean a cap of the club's spend has to be you know whatever, whatever percentage it's agreed on, but not a hundred and four percent of their income just on fair salaries. Just on that, Peter, I'd be interested to get your thoughts on the the issue of a, of a salary sort of cap, into, whether that's as a wage bill or or players individually, because I think the the argument would be that would it encourage more players uh, to go to jump up to higher divisions in the Premier League and get more money there rather than stay at their clubs for longer? Because I don't necessarily know how realistic it is. Um, that we can expect for salary caps to exist in in the Premier League. I'd love that idea to happen. Don't get me wrong, but I I, I just can't picture uh, the FA going to Mr Mansour or um, or Mr Woodward and saying, "No, you're not allowed to pay such and such amount of money." Um, it, yeah, it's, it's hard to envisage, isn't it? It's yeah, hard to so envisage, but. So. Either, there's two ways it could happen for me. I'm, I'm not saying it will. It's just in my head, oh, theorise yeah. it could happen. There's a, a sort of a very broad brush salary cap where it's right. No player can earn above X just from their wages. Now, if they want to be paid like bonuses by their club, where it's you know a win bonus, goal bonus, whatever, on top, that's fine because it's come. It comes out of the you know that the club's accounts anyway, or they have like they do in the MLS, which I know the MLS kind of gets a bad rep in, in in England especially. But there's a lot of ideas where you know there's a few players, that, for example, that are like the designated players or whatever. They get 
more of you know the re- the real big stars, and then a lot of the other ones have a fairly a fairly modest by um, sort of in, in a high, a high domestic league standard salary, and then. Yeah, I mean, I you get a lot of people it, in the MLS on sort of League One wages, don't you? Yeah, but it's, it's just so many factors that intersect, and then you think, hold on a minute, then what about what about transfer fees and the lack of transparency about that? Maybe you know, even do away with that. Maybe there's a, a better way of transferring players between clubs where it's more equitable, and you know, all, just so many different issues that spring to mind where and I've helped the demise of Barry, but you know, it could easily happen to somebody else if things don't change. I think a, a big start could be seriously looking at, it, it's sort of what you've touched on already, is seriously looking at how we work with the financial fair play rules. Because I think yeah. at, at the moment there's just so right. many loopholes. You know, if a, if a, if an owner just wants to give money to the club, he can do, or like we've seen in the championship where you see the stadium sold to a separate company so that your books look £50 million better than they actually are. We need to start tackling this, nipping it in the bud. It's not not even nipping it in the bud. I mean, it's what we saw very two, three seasons ago under day where players on huge wages were coming in. And I I don't think anyone that was paying attention thought for one second Barry could really afford that. No, I didn't think it. And I... I said I said as such in the summer, just that summer of 2017, when it was you know Jermaine Beckford, Jay O'Shea, as much as I liked him, and you know all these other players, awesome. Chris Maguire and such, who I did like, you know obviously the signing of at the time, and just thought, you know where's this coming from? What you know it's just like it's just like somebody's gone to a casino and rolled the dice, and if it doesn't end up you know like two sixes or whatever, it's just it's not going to work. It's going to end up in the situation which unfortunately it has now, where there isn't probably isn't going to be a club in the next few days because they'll probably get liquidated because of farcical financial decisions based on essentially one man's dream or ego, if you want to look at it especially negatively. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, cause the, cause the overwhelming sort of comments I've heard is they was... They had sort of the right intentions, but was terrible at executing it. Mm-hmm. And and Dale sort of come in and try to make a, a quick book almost is is sort of perhaps how you could interpret what he's done. Yeah, I think retrospectively, perhaps the the good intentions of Day are less benevolent than meets the eye, particularly with, with regards to the stadium, which is the obviously the main. Mortgage in the stadium to the hill, which is obviously the, was the main sort of stumbling block for CNN in particular to be able to take over. And it was always going to be a big stumbling block for anybody to come in because it just creates such a high bar for any, any new owner to come in because obviously many owners, most owners don't see their money, their investment, if you like, ever a return on it or anything like it. A proportionate return on it, especially outside the top six in the Premier League. So, uh, sorry if, if, I, if I can just kind of come in at this point. Uh, I, I think that that's you've kind of tapped into a huge problem there because I think that um, the we're seeing in and, and Chris Wilson know this is an Oldham fan as well. Um, we're seeing lots of sort of um, ethically questionable owners at clubs in in the EFL at the moment, and I think a big part of that is because there's not the range of choice of potential owners, and that means it's very hard to get uh, the right owner because. I think there's a lot of of businessmen who love a certain club, uh, and if they could get close to sort of breaking even on owning it, um, that's something they would kind of do. But mm-hmm. I think because there's such a because it costs so much to keep a club afloat, let alone competitive, um, I think that you're seeing uh, not many owners it not being particularly appealing to uh, to own a football club at the moment, and that means that the the choice in terms of uh, getting the right owners um, is much narrower, and that's why we're seeing um, probably the wrong owners uh, coming into our game. I yeah. completely agree with that. Completely yeah, I think, agree with that. I think some of that issue as well is they're spending so much money to keep the clubs afloat, to to keep them functioning at a, at a reasonable level that they then treading water, isn't it? It's just treading water, yeah, but they they then think that they have a right to to 
push themselves more to the forefront of the, of the footballing side. So like with Oldham, where you've got uh, alleged interference in, in first team affairs and it, it's been documented at Oldham, but it's, it's surely happening at more clubs. And <laughs> that's the problem you've got. They're spending all this money. They interfere with bits that Oldham shouldn't really interfere with. And you create a new issue that isn't purely financial. I mean, it's a domino effect as well. It's not just that, but same for a club sponsor, so like a shirt sponsor. If if the costs are so high, which sectors are going to, you know, front that cost to be on the front of uh, lots of shirts? Obviously, mainly it's it's betting, for example. I'm not saying betting is the worst thing ever or whatever. That's not really my point, but it's just lots of people have lots of questions uh, from a moral stance about that. And that's kind of what most of them are, or in the Premier League, it's kind of international conglomerates from, say, a lot of them from the Middle East, for example, where, you know, it's not exactly black and white morality and lots of the dealings there either. So it's just, it's just a massive cycle of, I don't know, just, I don't know. So drifting further and further away yeah. from their community bases upon which they were founded and becoming a, a mesh of well, I mean, you know, assets that aren't owned by the club, owners that come in because they have big egos and probably are the only people who can actually afford to run them in a sustainable level due to the huge disparities in wealth that have been created by the the Premier League and you know the the lack of the lack of distribution of monies coming down to to smaller clubs. I mean, and and the bad governance of football in general, which we've discussed, and it's it needs to be addressed. I have. Zero faith that it will be at this moment in time, um, and I, let, I just hope that we don't see any more clubs disappear. But right now, I'm not feeling particularly hopeful on that either. So, well, well ju- just on the uh, the zero faith, I completely understand sort of where you're coming from, and uh, and sort of uh, the, uh, there is sort of uh, a kind of uh, an apathy. Um, I, I suppose what I would say from my point of view as someone who I really want this situation, these situations to be resolved. I really want um, the, the relevant people to act. I think you've got, in my opinion, and this is how I, um, I personally would like to sort of respond to the situation, is address the FA and the Premier League and the EFL in terms of um, look at the importance of changing the way you do things rather than you're all uh, so and so is for not doing things this way. I think it's important to sort of look at things in a, a more forward way. Now I know that's very difficult because it's very hard to to maintain some faith in in our governing bodies, and I completely understand that. But at the same time, I think that sometimes if we um, if we fight uh, the main governing bodies, that's going to make them less likely to listen. So I think sort of maybe having some sort of um, of hope that they might be um, willing to, to listen and change the way they do things. For me, that's that's how I um, prefer to, um, to look at the situation. And on that note, I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it there. But I, I completely agree with that line of thinking, Gabe. And I hope that your faith um, is repaid with, with, with action. And, you know, that's what we all hope. And it's for the bet- betterment of the game of football. But more importantly, it's for the betterment of all the communities that rely heavily on the clubs that are deeply embedded within those communities. So, uh, But Peter Taylor, I know it's been a difficult discussion for you and it's been very hard for you to to sort of come on to this podcast. But we do really appreciate your thoughts on this because you come across so intelligently. You've clearly deeply thought about um, how football needs to change. And so we really appreciate your time. Yeah, pleasure to be on always. And Gabe, of course, always appreciate your your insight and your clearly well thought through proposal. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, really sad situation, but um, I, yeah, I, I just hope that, that changes can be made. So uh, yeah, take care, everyone. And Chris as well, mate. Cheers for your time. As you know, me and Chris put a lot of effort into this uh, podcast week in, week out. And I suppose, Chris, you'd echo my thoughts that let's just hope things do improve. Yeah, um, and this podcast should be talking about all the good that goes on in League 1 and 2, and it's really sad that we've been met with this situation. Yeah, completely agree with that. As I just said earlier in this podcast, you know, there's some great stuff going on at clubs. I just wish that's all we could focus on and, and get away from some of the problems, but 
I suppose we have to make people aware of them, keep the discussions going, and hopefully we'll affect change. Um, but until next time, guys, thank you for listening to this. If you want to become a patron, you can do for as little as 80p a month. Patron campaign you'll find on our Twitter page and on our website. Um, but yeah, we'll see you next weekend and hopefully get back to talking about a bit of football. But until then, catch you later, guys. Yeah.